Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. On behalf of the University of Southampton, I'm delighted to welcome you, um, staff, students, alumni and supporters. You're joining us from around the world and I'm really pleased to welcome you. I'm Professor Jackie Bridges. I'm Professor of Old People's Care working in the School of Health Sciences at the University. I'm a registered nurse and my personal research interests are around the organisational conditions that make it possible for staff in health and social care to deliver great care to older people. I also teach uh, nurses around person-centred care and research as well. I'm the research and enterprise lead for the school and it's in that capacity that I'm hosting this evening's event. We're so pleased that you can join us for this next in the series of lectures focusing on COVID-19 and the university's response. Tonight, the spotlight is going to turn to colleagues from health sciences here at Southampton and highlight the key role that's been played in moving us uh, back out of the pandemic. You may know that nursing at the University of Southampton has ranked within the world's top 10 for the fifth successive year in this year's QS World University Rankings. We're, we're ranked third among UK universities as a, as a whole university. And the School of Health Sciences is renowned for its, uh, the quality of its research and well known for its highly skilled staff dedicated to in innovating in research and education to create positive changes within healthcare in the UK and globally. And we work to ensure that nursing and allied health professions continue to be professions that attract the brightest and the best. We're very proud of what we do, as you can tell. So tonight, we're going to hear from two of my colleagues from within the School of Health Sciences, Professor Julie Cullen, followed by Dr. Pete Worsley. And they are going to discuss the vital part that the school has played in the mammoth effort, both to administer vaccines to the population in the UK, and also to create perfect fitting face masks uh, for staff working at the front line um, in the fight against COVID-19. So after we've heard from Julie and Pete, we'll move into the Q&A section of the event. Some of you have sent in questions already, and thank you for those. We're going to, we hope we'll be able to get through as many as we can. You can still submit questions um, either now or during the uh, presentations or following them please use the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. And please remember to include your name with the question. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker tonight, Professor Julie Cullen. Uh, Julie is the head of the Department for Nursing, Midwifery and Health. Um, and she brings to the role a huge amount of global, clinical, operational and strategic leadership expertise and experience. Julie's been awarded the highly coveted title of Queen's Nurse in recognition of her strategic commitment to improving standards of care. And tonight, Julie's going to take us through the vaccinated training journey from October 2020, when the vaccines had yet to be approved, to telling us how the training programme was put together and rolled out within a matter of weeks. Julie, we're very pleased to have you here with us tonight. So thank you, Jackie, for that introduction. And it's lovely to be here with you all. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to talk to you about how colleagues in the School of Health Sciences played their part in preparations for the mammoth COVID-19 vaccination programme that's now happening across England. Let me just give you the outcome of the project because it's always nice to know what the finish was and then you can listen to the detail that went in behind it. The outcome of the project was that the staff in the school, supported by Health Education England, organised trainers and technicians to deliver and manage 18 sessions of new vaccinator training over two days. We taught around 180 participants, which were members of the public, to give intramuscular injections using specially designed training pads to help simulate the procedure. The focus that I'd like to give this talk, however, is how successful organisations can be in working together in a really short time frame when there's truly collaborative intention and shared vision amongst everybody concerned. And I'm really pleased to say that there was in this, in this occasion. 
So please let me take you back to October 2020. We didn't at that time have a COVID-19 vaccine approved or regulated, but we knew that it was going to happen and our government knew that a mass vaccination programme was going to need to take place. And for that, we were going to need new vaccinators without affecting the staff and daily business of the NHS that were already so busy and overloaded. We therefore had to look at new venues and new staff to be able to vaccinate safely. So to do that, the human medicines regulations were amended so that a wider range of people could be trained to administer the vaccinations. And the, the regulations approved people to, to vaccinate the COVID-19, but also the flu vaccinations. And they were going to include people such as allied healthcare professionals, physiotherapists, for instance, who would not normally give, who may not normally give injections, airline staff, lifeguards, community fire officers that may have been furloughed or have be able to volunteer some of their time and healthcare students who wouldn't normally administer vaccinations. So that was October 2020. By November 2020, one month later, universities and NHS trusts were being asked to work together to deliver the training for that new vaccinator workforce. So note the time frame. I, am, I attended my first meeting with Health Education England and the other local universities and healthcare providers in the third week of November 2020 to discuss how we were going to achieve what was required. So imagine my shock when I found out that the training of new vaccinators was going to need to occur during December. And this was so that the NHS would be ready to deliver the vaccination programme as soon as the vaccine became available. And by that time, we knew it was going to be early January. The timescale was unprecedented. So for clarity, just let me be clear. The administration of the vaccines was a separate project and was going to largely take place, as you now know, in primary care networks and vaccination centres. The School of Health Sciences was being requested to support the training of the new vaccinator workforce that would actually be giving those intramuscular injections. So the statutory and mandatory training required, including basic life support and anaphylaxis training, would occur online and be managed elsewhere. Our remit was to actually teach people to be able to give the actual in injection. So from the word go, and this was um, amazing and a really good project to be part of. We worked particularly collaboratively with Solent University and Uni University Hospital Southampton NHS Foundation Trust, UHS as many of you know it. And the plan was supported by that online material to deliver that intramuscular injection training and we would deliver that for each individual person over a period of an hour. We were going to run three sessions per day to run initially on three days, although in the end we, we uh, managed to do it in two days. And we were going to do it on the 10th and 11th of December. So we were already in the third week of November and we were going to get this up and running by the, by, by the 10th and 11th of December. We found that we could accommodate 10 students in each of three skill suites with two facilitators teaching in each skill suite. So we had a capacity of 270 new vaccinators that could be trained over the three days. You'll remember me saying that we actually trained 180 and that's because we went to two days. We developed a lesson plan that was adaptable um, to, to ensure we could deliver the training safely and efficiently, including considerable preparation time. And we were going to run sessions at 9, 11 and 4 on each of the days. Of course, we were doing this under COVID-19 health and safety restrictions, which required two metre distancing, um, PPE, wearing face coverings, washing hands before entering the room, not sharing equipment, um, etc. We had an amazing team of both lecturers. I need to particularly name Jilly Manx and Helen Crook that worked together putting this together. And we had an amazing team of technicians. And I particularly want to mention there um, John Veer and Una, a whole team of people working together to make this happen. So we had 
enough equipment, the enough injection pads, but what we didn't have was consumables. So we spoke to our local hospital um, at Southampton, uh, and as a training establishment, if you take your if you take your mind back to that time, then consumables were very difficult to get, and and the priority was for them to go to the hospitals, understandably. So we liaised with the hospital that would actually be able to order the equipment for us, the needles, the syringes, the facility uh, for disposing of the sharps um, to, to be able to give us the consumables ready to do. We sought permission from the Central University because we had to conform to being able to deliver what was possible within government guidance at that time to use our skill suites for this training. And we'd particularly identified those dates because they were available and free from being used by students. We had to be sure that we didn't disrupt our students' programmes of education. And we investigated permission and were given permission to use our university car parks. So, the training went ahead. It was absolutely amazing. So recruitment and, and the organisation of who would attend what session and when was managed by Health Education England. And we had everything waiting within our skill suites for people to arrive and be trained. They each had a checklist of competencies to ensure that they were safe and they would have this signed when they had been able to evidence that they were competent at giving a injection into the deltoid muscle, which is just about here. So what's the feedback and learning from this? Overall, it was a great success. And the candidates that we trained were very pleased and excited to have that opportunity. They were very grateful that the university had, had put on this training at such short notice. And they were raring to go to be able to use their new skills in the, in the vaccination sessions that were being set up by the NHS. That said, there were just a few areas to learn from. We, we were a little disappointed that we had greater capacity um, and we could, have, we could have trained 270 people, but actually we trained 180 and, that, and that's to be proud of. A few candidates hadn't received as much information as we would have liked prior to them arriving. So some of our training time was taken up a little bit with answering questions that we could have provided information in advance. But that's the beauty of hindsight. And if we were to do this again, we'd make sure that for more information had reached them in advance. And some of that was about working across organisations. But these are really small points and the only points that were inconvenient across the, the, the two days. So rather than leaving on those points, I think it's important to conclude with affirmation of the success of the project. The candidates enjoyed the experience I'm absolutely sure that many of them have been partaking in the vaccination clinics and some of you may have been vaccinated by those very people. They were thrilled to get involved in the training and the practical elements of the training and so were we. The staff were, were upbeat, they were pleased to be part of um, the, the whole COVID-19 delivery. So finally, I just want to reiterate, it's an example of how effectively different organisations can work together to deliver such a project at such short notice. And I think this is a real success we can all take pride in. So I hope you've enjoyed listening um, to it and I'd be delighted as and when appropriate to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Julie, for that insight into that incredible achievement and uh, contribution uh, you've made to the vaccination programme. Um, we should be very proud of the team at Health Sciences. If you have questions for Julie, please post them um, using the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. So moving on to our next presentation, we'll be hearing from Dr. Peter Worsley. Peter is an Associate Professor um, in the School of Health Sciences and his research experiences and clinical experiences as a physiotherapist have fueled a passion for how science can help understanding of how to tackle uh, significant healthcare challenges. In 2012, he joined the newly formed Skin Health Research Group, which is one of our key research groups in health sciences. 
Tonight, Pete's going to talk to us about the work his team has been undertaking in response to the pandemic. They've used state-of-the-art computer software and MRI facial scans to precisely determine how face masks interact with different face shapes and sizes. As we know, personal protective equipment, or PPE, is vital for frontline workers, keeping them safe when they're treating people with COVID-19. The project Pete's going to share with you is, is about providing new design templates for safe PPE devices, ensuring that they fit for all individuals and interface safely with the skin. He's also going to discuss how his work complements the PERSO project that some of you might already be familiar with from a previous lecture. Pete, we're so pleased to have you with us tonight. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Peter Worsley. I'm an Associate Professor at the School of Health Sciences at the University of Southampton. I'm a physiotherapist by background uh, with a PhD in bioengineering. I've been working in a skin health research group uh, for the last 10 years. Um, so this afternoon, this evening, um, I want to talk to you about safe and effective respiratory protective equipment, trying to cater for the needs of a diverse population of healthcare workers. So as I'm sure you're all aware, personal protective equipment has become an essential part of the fight against coronavirus, protecting staff and patients. And I'm sure many of you um, have seen the news and have been involved in, in fundraising for projects such as Perso, uh, which was designed to create new and effective personal protective equipment um, for those working uh, in the coronavirus pandemic, both in the UK and overseas. Um, Many of my colleagues who were working on PERSO I know personally, and this is a project that's very complementary to the work that they've done. So PPE or personal protective equipment typically involves things such as eye protection, filtering respirator mask, fluid gown resistance, disposable aprons and gloves. And as you, as you can see in the image, it tends to mean that these clinicians are dressed head to toe in personal protective um, devices um, and it's really critical that they wear uh, this equipment to shield both the healthcare professional from the disease and to stop it from spreading to, uh, to others as well um, and clearly uh, with the airborne transmission of the virus having all these layers of protection is absolutely vital. One of the uh, most significant pieces of equipment is a filtering face piece respiratory uh, mask, which effectively uh, encompasses the nose and the mouth um, and protects any kind of airborne fluid particles from entering into the, the individual or from being expelled. And within the NHS, typically they use something called an FFP3 uh, respirator mask, um, which is, offers the highest level of protection. Um, typically, masks are single sh um, shift use only. Um, and don't aren't typically reusable. Um, so we've gone through billions and billions of these masks during the pandemic, both in the UK and overseas. Now it's critical that these masks have a really nice tight and secure seal with the individual, um, because ultimately the FFP3 masks have to filter 99% of the particles, um, stop them from sort of exiting and entering uh, the mask and the skin interface. So you need a really well conforming mask uh, that's strapped fairly tightly to the face in order to achieve that seal. Um, and what we have, what we do in the UK is actually do a fit test to make sure the mask fits the individual appropriately. And that's performed by trained individuals. They have specialist equipment that typically involves a, a qualitative test, which involves smelling and a quantitative test where they can actually measure the number of particles in and around the mask area itself. But when we've worked with colleagues, uh, particularly from NHS England and the Department of Health and Social Care, we've started to see some trends in terms of individuals who struggle to get masks that fit properly. And that tends to be um, in those that are female and in particular ethnic minority groups. And this isn't something that's new to the current pandemic. There was a, a TUC report in 2007 which actually highlighted that many of these masks weren't fit for purpose within a diverse population. 
Um, and ultimately, when you track back uh, to why this might be, it's because many of the standards by which the masks are made rely on facial measurements uh, that were originally derived from an average white male face shape. And what we've seen from the British Medical Association, the Royal College of Nursing, is these sorts of statements. PPE is often neither personal nor protective for women. It doesn't work as it should because the wearer is the wrong gender. And again, it, it's just sort of looking at that disparity between the design principles from which the masks and equipment are made and clearly the diversity of the population that they now have to cater for, particularly during the pandemic. And these are some of the news articles that have come out. Huge calls for better masks to protect healthcare professionals. We want to see these masks used more widely within health and social care. Uh, and this has really come from, you know, the, the top scientific advisors to, to protect healthcare workers. And there has been a huge amount also of misspent money. So a number of masks have been procured. They've subsequently been found that they're not fit for purpose. And that has wasted effectively governmental money. So hundreds of millions of pounds spent on masks that perhaps weren't fit for purpose. So there's a clear issue here in terms of getting these masks right and trying to make sure they cater for our healthcare workers. One of the other things we've done in Southampton is look at the effects of wearing these masks on skin health. And there's a number of reports to show that those that wear the mask for a prolonged period can get a number of different skin issues, including redness, rashes, spots, and particularly um, sites over the bridge of the nose, they can actually get pressure ulcers where the skin and soft tissues are, are damaged. And you can see the image here, you know, these staff, they, they effectively have bruising and redness um, that conforms to the shape and the size of the mask. So you can see it's clearly down to the, the, the respirator that's actually caused this damage. And we did a national survey as a group um, and again, showed that um, these rates were up to 50 or 60% of individuals wearing these masks had some form of skin reaction. Um, so there's a real need to improve not just the design to make sure they fit, but also to make sure that the materials they're made from and that the guidelines for which they're, ap they're applied uh, protect individual skin health uh, when wearing them. So in Southampton, we were very well set up to, to support the, the issue. Um, we had already led an international network called Medical Devices and Vulnerable Skin. And our network wanted to look at all sorts of different devices used in healthcare to try and make them safer and also think about um, intelligent means by which we can monitor their application. This involved a, a multidisciplinary team of healthcare scientists, engineers, clinicians, and industrial representatives to really try and um, find innovation within the medical device market. And it's really important that we look at the, the shape and size of these devices as well as the materials from which they're made. So here's our network. We have a, a website set up, uh, www.sotten.ac.uk forward slash MDBSN, and we're on Twitter. And on there, you'll see that the, the network encompasses lots of different things. So we've worked in prosthetics and orthotics, um, cervical collars, respiratory masks, support surfaces. Um, we look at things like uh, orthosis uh, in, at the shoe interface as well. So we have a very broad remit of different devices that interact with the skin surface. And what we really wanted to do is translate some of that fundamental understanding and knowledge from the, the net that, that we ran uh, over the course of five years into the issue of improving respiratory protective equipment. So in January of this year, um, UKRI, the, the sort of UK research um, and innovation hub, um, funded through the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, uh, we funded this project Be Safe RPE and that was basically applying some of these techniques that we'd used for things like uh, respiratory masks onto respiratory protective equipment. Um, so that included looking at the masks um, in a lab-based setting, so measuring how much pressure and 
temperature and humidity there is between the mask and the individual. It's using computational modeling to, to look at the goodness of fit of the mask and working with, with colleagues um, to actually look at how the skin and soft tissues deform when the masks are applied. And ultimately, we wanted two main um, applications. One, one, an approach to support the fitting of masks, to make an intelligent means to, to select the right mask uh, more quickly for individuals. And the second, to create um, a standard test template uh, for manufacturers to follow in order to provide a range of masks that fit the diverse population. As with all our projects, it was very much a, a multidisciplinary effort. So we partnered with NHS England and Improvement, Cardiff University, industrial representatives, individuals from end user groups such as the University Hospital Southampton and National Police Coordination Centre and our funders. Um, so this created a, a really strong and powerful means for us to deliver high quality research. And the, the areas that we've managed to deliver are, are things like this new design template, um, working with manufacturers to say, this is the size and the shape and the materials that the masks need to be made from. We're developing standard test methods to create better international um, standards from which the masks are tested. So typically masks have to meet a European standard and we want to try and increase and elevate that standard to make sure the masks are fit for purpose. And we've also created and tested a free to access software platform where healthcare professionals can have their face scanned and it can automatically support the fitting and selection of the right mask. So we're continuing also to, to look at skin health as well. That's really important to us that we try and improve skin health. So we've recruited cohorts of healthcare workers and measured their skin health before and after uh, they wear the device. We've done a multi-center survey showing how different skin reactions manifest and how perhaps the type and design of mask might um, influence how the skin responds. And we're continuing our lab-based assessment of masks using these uh, measurements of, of uh, contact conditions with the mask, but also, as you can see in the image here, we sample non-invasively things from the skin surface that tell us whether or not the skin's likely to break down. Um, this is our modeling platform. So we, we're really keen to model and simulate the way the mass interact with the skin and soft tissues. And through the modeling approach, we can also do things like vary the, the face size and shape to see how that affects the mass fitting uh, and how it affects the, the contact conditions with the skin. And this is our face capture system. So we have a, um, two sets of cameras that can automatically pick up the face size and shape. It can automatically identify features on the face and position the mask so that we can estimate uh, which sort of mask is, is going to fit and why. And we've also managed to work with our colleagues in NHS uh, England and Improvement to publish national guidelines on the safety of these masks uh, and how clinicians can um, protect their skin health. So we've now uh, established the uh, frequency of breaks that are needed, the sort of um, skin preparation before wearing the mask and also how to optimize uh, the recovery of the skin after wearing the mask too. So in summary, um, PPE is vital to protect all frontline workers and, and our research with colleagues from NHS England and the Department of Health and Social Care have shown that current designs aren't fit for purpose to accommodate the wide range of genders and ethnicities within the healthcare workforce. We've also seen that those masks that don't fit properly can cause skin damage. So through our grant, we're trying to create safe design templates and test methods to improve the mask designs. We've worked with colleagues to create national guidelines for protecting skin health. And we hope uh, in the future that we can inform international standards uh, from which the, all future masks will be made. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Thank you, Pete. A great example of how research can actually improve uh, real life healthcare practice and real evidence that one size doesn't fit all. Um, so we're now going to move into the uh, Q&A uh, time, time of the evening.
Uh, do post any questions or comments that you've got in using the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we've had some through already and um, I'm going to move on to those now. Julie, I've got a question for you. Um, you over this is from Penny Hamilton, who, who says you oversaw an amazing training. How many injections did the student have to demonstrate to their assessors, please? Well, um, do you know, I can't recall the answer. I can't give you an accurate answer for that. But what I can tell you is that all of those fine details were um, set on a national scale. And that's where the collaboration came in. So, so we worked with lots of local other higher education establishments and training was happening all over the country. And we made sure that we all set the same standards. So it, it, uh, it was a double pronged approach that it wasn't just the number, it was also the quality um, of, of how they were performing, but it was assessed and signed off by trained registrants and skills facilitators. I'm sorry, I can't give you the accurate number. I think I know, but I'd be guessing. Thank you, Julie, thank you very much. Uh, Pete, I've got a couple of questions here about PPE. Uh, this one's from, I, somebody didn't leave their name, but uh, with, the question is, do you think that all healthcare professions should be using PPE like masks as normal practice in the future? Um, well, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen post pandemic. Um, I think certainly uh, we're a long way from being out of the woods now. So there's definite advocacy to be wearing FFP3 masks for a significant period, particularly in critical care units where you are interacting with COVID patients regularly. Um, ultimately, as, as the pandemic settles, or hopefully settles, uh, we can transition away from um, using the, the, these types of respirators. Um, but I think we, we are perhaps going to see mask wearing um, being more commonplace in society and in healthcare, um, but perhaps at a, at a lower level, perhaps, you know, these surgical masks or cloth masks that are, that are very much um, in use on a more, more widespread basis. Thank you. And I've got a question that came in relatively early, and I think you may have addressed it in your presentation from Tamara Eileen. Are you using the reusable respirator developed at Southampton University? No. So the, the reusable system or the, or the PERSO system is a, is a hood. Um, so effectively, the, the hood is a different type of respiratory protective equipment that encompasses the whole sort of head and shoulders. Uh, whereas we're just looking at the disposable uh, masks, which just cover the nose and mouth. Um, we've seen, obviously, great success with Perso, and that's been rolled out to Southampton and lots of other uh, healthcare institutions in the UK and overseas. Um, but at the moment, FFP3 masks and these disposable masks are very much the dominant piece of equipment that gets used. Um, so I had a talk from 3M, which is one of the largest manufacturers um, internationally, and I think they've sold I think over 7 billion FFP3 masks in the last 12 months. So the scale of these masks is absolutely huge. Um, but obviously, we want to make sure that they're fit for purpose uh, when they're being made. Absolutely. I, can I do a follow-up to that and sort of ask you how much international variation is there in PPE uh, specification? And where does your own research group sit in relation to global contribution to science in this area? Yeah, so um, in terms of global variation, surprisingly little. So actually, when the, the pandemic first broke, particularly in, in China and Asia, we started to get reports of these um, skin related issues, skin reactions from wearing masks and fitting issues, because a lot of the masks that they imported to China were actually based on European standards which again come back to this sort of average white male face shape or, the, or what they call the Sheffield model. Um, so actually the masks don't vary considerably uh, internationally or didn't sort of 18 months ago. I think in the last six months or 12 months there's been a big push to accommodate uh, different ethnicities and different face shapes. Um, so you are now starting to see more re regional mask variants. Um, and actually the Department of Health and Social Care in the UK have put in a huge effort to um, increase the, the breadth of masks that we offer and also um, secure the UK supply chain of masks. So actually there, there's been a, a huge improvement, um, but we still think there's scope for a bit more. Mm. Absolutely. And do you want to show off how unique your research offering is from your research group? Uh, well, we're, yeah, we're very fortunate in that um, 
uh, as a research group, we're, we're a mixture of engineers, implementation health scientists, a, a physio by background, and also we support a lot of uh, clinical academics. So clinicians who have uh, remained in practice, but are signed up to do a PhD with us in Southampton. Uh, and certainly Southampton has been one of the leading lights in this clinical academic career pathway. And within the Skin Health Research Group, um, we very much have a, a good standing within Europe. I'm, I'm very much in, involved with European colleagues uh, in pressure ulcer prevention. And our medical device network is very much an international um, activity. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask one final one to, about PPE for you, Pete, and then I'm going to go back to Julie uh, for a little bit. Uh, so, C. Arnold, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, C. Arnold, Roberta Dudley asked, how effective are the very common pale blue two-layer masks? Um, so they are very effective, but they're not as effective as the, the FFP3 masks, which are specifically designed to, to sort of have this 99% uh, sort of resistance capability. But a, a two-ply surgical mask offers a huge amount of protection particularly um, protecting others. So when you wear these masks, you're predominantly protecting others from catching um, coronavirus because it's repelling any of the kind of the droplets, the air particles that come out naturally when you breathe. Um, so I think, you know, any type of mask, particularly a two-ply surgical mask or blue mask that you see is, is very effective. Um, and I would certainly advocate for, for wearing them, particularly in crowded spaces, um, especially with the, the Delta variant and how things are happening or, or transpiring in the country at the moment. Thank you. I've just had another question pop in from Joy Pickett, which is a sort of follow-up to this. So I, I will I will carry on with you for the moment, Pete. Which mask would you recommend for the general public? Yep. So for general public, I think a, a two-ply or a good quality cloth mask is more than sufficient. And, and as I said, it predominantly is there to protect others whilst you're within enclosed spaces. Um, so I think, you know, the masks are here to stay and I would, I would certainly be wearing a mask if I, if I went into an enclosed environment and um, there was poor ventilation um, and I was, you know, in close contact with others. I think it, it's the least we can do to add a, an additional layer of, of protection from spreading the virus. Um, and I would certainly advocate for their use. Thank you very much for now, Pete. I think we'll be back to you uh, if there's time. Uh, Julie, uh, I've got an um, anon anonymous question here. Did many student nurses come forward to be trained as vaccinators? So not particularly at that time, no. Um, and, and that was because they were really busy supporting the NHS in the roles that they were already at the stage of their training able to do. And we were very keen that student nurses didn't have their programmes disturbed. So because we're intrinsically linked with the NHS and 50% of the student nurses programme is actually in the clinical setting with, with um, clinical providers, we, we were very keen that they would keep their clinical hours up as they needed to be for them to finish their programmes um, at the t on the timeline that they were projected, if we could do so. Now, of course, because there was so much destabilisation of programmes and, and changes at that time, and we were all working within the government guidelines. Some of the student programmes were changed and restructured, but, but at every point it was so that they could finish their programmes as much as was possible on their original timeline. If we had added into the mix training them as vaccinators, then I think there would have been, well, we made the decision, there would have been a distinct um, effect on their trajectory of their programme. Now, some of them may well have gone to do that independently if they had, you know, there were very clear criteria who could train as a vaccinator. If they went ahead to do that in another role, then they may well have done that. But as part of their programme, actually vaccinating couldn't count as part of their programme hours so it was more important that they stayed on the trajectory of their programme because, of course, they were going to be the next workforce for the NHS. And that was the key thing to get them in fully functioning as registrants in the NHS as soon as possible. And, and there were other volunteers that weren't on that trajectory that came forward to be vaccinators. So it was um, it was trying to maximise the support for the NHS. Thank you, Julie. Um, 
I'm going to ask you a question about nurse retention now. Is that all right? It's not about the vaccinated training, but it's about nurse retention. So there have been reports of large numbers of nurses leaving the profession. What is Southampton doing to provide support to newly qualified nurses? So we've always worked very hard on um, supporting newly qualified nurses with in, in collaboration with our local trusts. Now, once a nurse does actually qualify, technically they become our alumni and they're no longer our students. But those that work in the local hospitals, we like to think that they might come back, for instance, and be a skills facilitator with us and actually spend a few hours with us still at the university, then teaching the next generation. But we do recognise that nurses need that support at that stage um, we call it preceptorship or, or um, development and support and mentorship. And actually, at the moment, there's a large project and investment um, happening between Health Education England, our local um, office, and the universities, where we're all working together to actually help retain nurses. So there's a slightly, slightly uh, a difference between, I think, what your um, question asks. It's a good question, what your the person that's asking the question has asked. You're quite right, there are some um, reports of perhaps nurses towards the other end of their career that are that are deciding that they're tired and may wanting to, to wind down or retire. But, uh, but as far as newly qualified nurses are concerned, actually what we've seen more than anything locally, and we can only speak for our own experience, is that the nurses can't wait to actually support and be part of the workforce, and they're eager to do so. Thank you, Julie. I have another question for you about vaccinated training. Will more training and support be required from Southampton if top-up winter jabs are required? So we don't know that yet, but if there is, then we've done it once, we can do it again. And I'm sure the other vaccinated trainers feel the same. Having said that, there's a very large cohort of people that now have been trained because um, as the tenure of my, my talk was about collaboration and working together, this was happening in lots of sites across the country. So there are now lots and lots of vaccinators and those vaccinators were actually trained to give both the COVID and the flu um, vaccination. So we believe that there are enough in, in circulation, but if it shows that there's not, then we can train more. Swing into action again. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Julie. I'm going to come back to Pete again. I've had a few more uh, trickling about PPE. Um, I think there's two about skin damage here, Pete. So I'm going to ask them together, if I can find them both at the same time. What steps can those in healthcare take to avoid skin damage from PPE slash masks? And... Um, Olga Debiech asks, can we use the mask fitting methods developed by your team? So in terms of the um, protecting skin health, um, a lot of it's about finding the right device in the first place. So working with the fit testers at your healthcare institution to identify a mask that both offers protection and that fits adequately. So I think part of the problem we've seen is that people inevitably increase the, the tension in the straps to achieve the seal, but by implication that puts more pressure on vulnerable spots like the bridge of the nose. So it, principally getting the mask right is very important in the first instance. It's then about having frequent breaks. So making sure you can remove the mask for a short period at regular intervals, every two to three hours if possible. Um, I think when the first wave hit, um, there was less awareness of needing to, to remove PPE and less ability, but actually trusts have really come on board supporting staff to take regular breaks to give themselves a rest and also their skin. Um, we have seen some use of things like um, prophylactic gels, so dressings put around, say, the bridge of the nose, but you, those are used with caution. You don't want to compromise the fitting of the mask by using a sort of protective layer of the skin. So I'd certainly advocate for the right mask and regular breaks uh, to protect the skin. And then the second question, uh, in terms of our fitting methodology, um, we're currently trialling that at Southampton. Um, so we're just getting our, our ethics through to actually trial that and compare it to current fit testing standards. So we've developed the kit and, and, and the algorithm to predict the, the mask fitting. Um, and it's now time for us to work with our fit testing colleagues in Southampton. Uh, and should that be successful, 
uh, then we'll certainly be looking to roll that out at a much larger scale. But um, bear with us, we still probably need six months or so to, uh, to bring that to fruition. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Anne Moran about the environmental impact of all this PPE that we've been eating up over the past 16 months. Are there any uh, solutions in sight for cutting back on the waste associated with this equipment? Yes, so we uh, we, we organised a sand pit event, and that, that effectively just brings together stakeholders who are interested in the topic. So there were industry and fit testers and clinicians there. And one of the things that did come up is well, how do we make better reusable masks that are better for the environment uh, and for the individual as well. If you get one that fits, perhaps you you know it'd be advantageous to reuse it. Um, some of the big challenges we have are from an infection prevention perspective. So within lots of these devices, there's various layers of material and various design features that make um, a high level cleaning very challenging. Um, so it's not like you can take the mask off and disinfect it quickly. There's a number of processes that you have to undertake to, to make sure the mask is clean between use. Um, so we were also enlisting the support of infection prevention specialists. And one of our, our our hopes and our outcomes is actually to support the design of reusable masks as well as disposables. Okay, I'm going to sail us into controversial waters here, potentially. How does Pete feel about masks no longer being mandatory? Um, so without sitting on, on too many political fences, um, my, my own personal impression, um, given the spread of the virus, is that if you're in an enclosed space and you feel as if there's limited ventilation and a crowd, I would still advocate for the use of mask, not to protect yourself, but to protect others. That, that's predominantly what the masks are there for. Um, so I'd, I'd actually advocate that we continue to wear masks, um, but it seems, you know, in line with the government guidelines, that's more of a, of a personal choice and more of a, an organisational choice. But I know that a lot of organisations and a lot of individuals will continue to wear masks. Um, and I, I would strongly support that. Thank you. Um, and a follow up to that, somebody asked, are the particular, um, so if you're clinically very vulnerable, are there additional precautions you would recommend a member of the public took with regard to mask wearing? Um, so is this the, the vulnerable individual wearing the mask? or Yeah, so would, would you recommend a different sort of higher spec type of mask in that situation? Again, not, not necessarily because the masks are there to protect um, people around the individual wearing the mask. So what I'd say if you are vulnerable is to get those that you're interacting with to wear masks, particularly if you're in an enclosed space, to socially distance, to wash your hands, to make sure all these things are in place to be as safe as possible. Um, but I, yeah, I'd certainly advocate for the individual to wear a mask as well because um, it would also protect the, the people that they're, they're working with or socialising with. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of really lovely rounding up questions as we move into the final few minutes of the evening. Um, so this is this question is for both of you, and I'll, I'll I'll take Julie first and then Pete. Julie, how important is the close relationship between the university and the hospital in Southampton? Um, so I, I can I can answer that in one word. It's absolutely essential. Um, how important is it? essential we our students are intrinsically linked with our local hospital our staff are intrinsically linked with um, organizing placements and a good student experience the hospital recruit our students when they graduate and we like to think that we spend the whole of their program preparing them for that moment and um, just linking it slightly with the last question we have a whole section of the programme that is preparing them for when they're a registrant and professional practice to, to bridge that gap between be, being a student and being a registrant within our local hospital. Um, and we, we do try and organise and work with the hospital to give students a good experience in both the university and the hospital, because it's always, of course, students have the choice where they go for their future careers, but it's always lovely to see them stay local and then be part of our local hospital's workforce. 
So in answer to your question, Jackie, essential, uh, those links are um, what either organisation could not survive without the other. The links are essential. Thank you. And it, Catherine de Ricerto um, asked the question. So thank you, Catherine. Brilliant question. Pete, over to you for an answer from you. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo Julia's sentiment there. Um, particularly, I'm a, I teach on the physiotherapy programme, so we also benefit from all of those wonderful links with the University Hospital of Southampton. Um, and from a research perspective, uh, our group's actually based at the hospital site. Um, so on level A of the hospital, we have all our, our labs and our offices. Um, so a, for a project like our respiratory protective equipment, uh, all I have to do is walk up the stairs to level D to talk to the fantastic Rachel who leads the fit testing. She tells me which masks are working, which aren't working, where the problems lie. So we can embed all of our research questions within clinical practice, which is, as a, as a school of health sciences, uh, our, our primary motivation. So we are, we are blessed to be at the hospital site uh, and reap the rewards um, because there's wonderful facilities such as the Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Facility, which offer state-of-the-art facilities for us to um, make the most of our research ideas. Thank you, Pete. Okay, stay, stay there, Pete, for the, next, for the final question of the evening. What does each of the panel think the next challenge in healthcare will be with respect to COVID in the year ahead? So get your crystal ball out. Um, well, I, I have a really um, strong interest in, in long COVID. So as a, as a physio and, and nurse and, and AHPs, we're very much interested in, in the rehabilitation and the long-term management of individuals. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're still going to see some acute pressures of COVID. Um, you know, we're seeing 700 or so hospitalizations um, a day at the moment. So we're still seeing an acute issue. But I think, you know, in the next six to nine months, we're going to see the long term issue of managing those individuals who have had COVID and have some of these lasting symptoms. Um, so there's lots of um, very interesting research, but also areas of clinical practice to understand the implications of the virus and how we manage these individuals. Thank you, Pete. Julie, how about you? What does your crystal ball say? So I think the question is, what are the greatest challenges that we can see ahead? Um, so, you know, I've had the luxury of 30 seconds probably to think about my answer. And I think the greatest challenge is going to be understanding how we all work together to understand more of COVID and how to manage it the best we can, maximising every professional skills while looking after the public and patients, working together, listening to each other, being, being prepared that what might have been right last year, we now know more and understand more month by month and may not be right for the future and listening and working with each other to be patient to, to manage, manage a new way of working as best as we can. So um, I hope that answers the question, but I think the greatest challenge is going to be working with something new for the first time and understanding as the data reveals itself and as we begin to understand the disease more, um, how to work with it so that, so that we keep people safe. Thank you. So we've got plenty to keep us busy in the months ahead. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to Professor Julie Cullen and Dr. Peter Worsley for their contributions this evening. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us tonight. As you can see, we're very proud um, of what we do here. And there's no doubt that the last 16 months have been a huge challenge for all of us. But we're really proud that we've been able to be part of the solution and the two uh, stories that you've heard tonight are just two of many, many contributions that Health Sciences has made to um, tackling the pandemic over the months and other healthcare challenges and social care challenges over the past year to two years. Um, and it's been a real privilege um, for us. So as I draw the evening to a close, in a moment, you'll see a short feedback poll on your screen and we we'd really uh, invite you to complete that. That would give us some really helpful feedback and it will take no more than two minutes, I promise you. If you want to watch the lecture again, we're going to be sharing the footage. So watch out uh, for details of how to do that popping into your inbox. Um, and you'll also uh, receive details of how to join our mailing list if you're not already on it, uh, so that we can keep you updated on future lectures.
And I just want to highlight the next event taking place this coming Thursday, uh, and now for something completely different. This event is called Sailing on the Edge, the Science Behind the Sport. And it focuses on high performance sport and how engineering and science underpin innovation. If you want to find out more, please head to www.soton.ac.uk forward slash events. That's www.soton.ac.uk forward slash events and click on Distinguished Lectures. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening.